We are nine weeks away from the start of the Paris 2024 Olympic Games and we're taking you every step of the way to the French capital. Sit, relax and enjoy, whether it be from the comfort of your couch or even your favorite sports bar. We are here for you. Hello, welcome. You're watching Louboutin. I'm Ricardo Chambers. Donald Oliver has decided to leave us all this week, but Leighton Levy, who I like to consider my better friend, senior writer at Sportsmax.tv, is with me. Leighton, how are you doing? It's good to be back, Ricardo. Donald is not my usual partner isn't here but certainly you, you certainly work <laughs> so let's get a show on the road huh i work that's disrespectful <laughs> <laughs> highly disrespectful but okay i'm gonna work for today i tell you something that donald didn't work well with last week um david riley was with us coach david riley a few weeks ago and he taught us a thing or two about relay running and uh, baton changing. Donald learned absolutely nothing because he was terrible last week. I just want to see how much you learned late in Levy. So I'm just going to do a simple pass and let's see. Let's go. Reach. Oh, that was so simple. Smooth. That was so simple and smooth. Last week, Donald Oliver was struggling really badly. And yeah, but as Leighton will tell you, he did not do track and field. Leighton, did you run on a really fast 4x1 team a long time ago in your life? No, the, there's a misperception, misconception about that. I used to manage that team. <laughs> the Bolts of Lightning, and you know, the at CAST, now known as the University of Technology, first club team in Jamaica to break 40 seconds in the 4x1. And of course, that team was a fantastic team with Wayne, Wayne Watson and of course, Michael Nevers. But, you know, that's been a long, long time ago, Ricardo. Let's move to the future. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the history lesson, Leighton. Anyhow, it's going to be a packed show. We'll be joined by one of the pioneers of women swimming in the Caribbean, Barbadian Leah Stansel. Some may know her better as Leah Martindale. Now, preparing for the Olympic Games goes way beyond the physical. And this Mental Awareness Month, we'll be seeking some tips for athletes to handle the pressure of preparing for this career-defining event. As we prepare to head to France, we'll get some French lessons. If you've been struggling with your French pronunciations, then you want to hang around. Mm, Donald will really need those lessons, but he's <laughs> not here. Anyhow, today we start with a discussion around Jamaica's big three female sprinters, Elaine thompson Hira, Shelley and Fraser Price, and Sharika Jackson. Combined, they've run just three races in 2024 so far, and unsurprisingly, Fans are losing their minds. We may need some mental health tips for the fans after Tom Sahira's less than impressive opener at the Eugene Diamond League meet on the 25th of May. We discussed these three in episode one, but given what has been happening in the space, we had to revisit this discussion. Um, Layton, let's start with Elaine Thompson Hero because she competed recently 11.30 seconds. Um, Finishing ninth in the Eugene Diamond League meet. What are you hearing? What do you make of what's happening with Tom Sahira? A lot of people are going crazy, but I don't know why. Look, one of the, one of the realities of what we're seeing with Elaine Tom Sahira, she's been battling injuries for the past few years. Last year, she started late, 11.24. She ended the season at 10.79. So if she started at 11.30, now remember, she hasn't raced since September 16th last year. She's had nine months of training under a new coach. And of course, adapting to the new coach, adapting to a new system and working hard, those legs might have been still heavy when she went to Oregon because based on what we're seeing, it may have been a late invite. Yeah. So she probably wasn't even tapered or, you know, te tempering down her preparations for the, for the longer season before she went into Oregon. So it's not really surprising to me that she ran 11.30 because based on what we've seen from her historically, it has run faster every single time she steps on the track. And so I think this is about another chicken little situation. We're making a mountain over, out of a molehill. Okay. On the concern meter for Elaine Thompson Hero, what number are you? Two. Okay. Well, so with, with pretty ten, much not well, concerned being, at all. I'm not yes. concerned at all. I mean, if we're seeing her in two or three races from now looking similar to what we saw in Oregon, then we should be concerned. But right now, the, the, the big challenge is because they... Grenada invitation has been cancelled. Yes. Whether or not she'll run in Jamaica at one of these all comers meets before the national championships. If we see from her a performance that mirrors what we saw in Oregon, maybe there's some concern about what she's going to be able to do longer term. But for right now, 
I'm not too, wor too worried at all. Okay, how about Sharika Jackson? 11 0 3 at 100, 22 82, negative wind at 200 meters. She is set to go in Oslo this week. Your thoughts? I thought the 11 0 3 showed that she's still in good shape. The 22 82 looking on heavy legs suggests to me that she was still lifting heavy when she went into Europe to run. So the 22 82 are also, again, another big concern for me as well because the thing about it is that. Maybe their strategy this year is going to be a little bit different from last year. Yes. Maybe she peaked at the wrong part of last season, which is why the reason why she didn't run faster at the World Championships in Budapest. Yeah. 1065 at the National Championships, 1074, uh, what was 1074 was? Or 1072 at, in Oregon suggests yes. that she may have peaked at the wrong time of the season. So maybe they're trying a different approach this season, which means that the approach is going to be a little bit more strategic, a little bit more cautious this year. So the 2282 and the 1103 tells me she still has good speed. And as soon as she starts to race more, expect her to run faster leading up into the national championships at the end of June. All right. Well, that's Elaine and Sharika. How about Shellyan Fraser-Price? Remember last year, she had a late start to her season as well opening her campaign at the Jamaica National Championships over 200 meters. She went on to a bronze medal at the World Championships in the 100 meters, and she also ran the backstretch, although she picked up an injury in the final of the 4x100, Jamaica winning the silver medal behind the United States of America. But at the end of the season, she had a conversation with Leighton Levy, and there is something that was said by Shelley and Fraser Price that I think is quite instructive. Let's take a listen. Not just race sharpness, but race confidence is one of those things that uh, an athlete needs. And last year it wasn't, or this year, it wasn't by choice or that, you know, I chose not to race early. It was because I was, I was having a setback in terms of my knee and other issues and I didn't want to chance it. So I really trusted my coach's judgment in that. So next year for sure, once I'm healthy, I really want to get things started earlier. So I can really build that, you know, that race momentum as I go into to the Olympics. Yeah, that interview was done in October 2023. And based on what was said by Shelley and Fraser Price, Leighton Levy, what do you make of it? That is where my area of concern is. Mm. <clears throat> because you heard her. She intends to start earlier once well she's intended. healthy. Yeah, <laughs> intended. Once she's healthy. Yeah. We're virtually at the end of May now, going into June. We're three and a half weeks from the national championships. We haven't seen her yet. So it suggests that not everything is, may not be right with the five-time world champion and, and two-time Olympic 100-meter gold medalist. So that, for me, is a little bit of a concern, whether or not we'll see her soon to help to allay some of those fears and how, she, how well she does is, is going to be the big question of whether or not she'll be ready to go into the championship, first of all, and then to Olympics in Paris in the, in the summer. Yeah, one of the things that Shelley and Fraser Price has shown in recent seasons is that she can start her season relatively late and still run fast and also that she doesn't need many races to run fast and I think her many fans right across Jamaica, right across the Caribbean and indeed the world are hoping that she will be in great shape and will be able to finish her career really strongly. Yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. We're going to take a break on Le Baton, but there is still so much more to come on today's show. Stick around. We'll be back. Yeah, you're watching Libertone Sportsmax's Max's build up to Paris 2024. Remember, Sportsmax is your home for the Olympic Games. In most territories in the Caribbean, you'll be able to watch on Sportsmax TV, but wherever you are across the region, the games will be available on the app. So download today from the Google Play or the App Store. Yeah, let's now take a dive back into the past as we catch up with a pioneer in Olympic swimming for the Caribbean, Leah Stansel. 
Now, she became the first black female in the history of the Olympic Games to reach a swimming final in the 50-meter freestyle. She is Barbados's national record holder in the 50 and 100 free, as well as 50-meter butterfly. She recorded her record-setting times in both the 150 free at the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, while she clocked her butterfly mark at the 2002 Commonwealth Games that was in Manchester, England. For outstanding performances, Stancy was named Barbados female sportsperson for three consecutive consecutive years from 1995 to 1997. She joins us now via Zoom. Leah Stansel, how are you doing? It is so amazing to finally catch up with you. Um, how are things? It's been a while. Um, things have been pretty good. Um, right now, um, I'm at work. I currently am the associate head coach um, at LSU. Um, so we've been we're now in our summer season and we have a few people getting ready for Olympics also um, or their Olympic trials. And so things have been going pretty well for me. Yeah, I realized that as well. And you've gone through a number of coaching jobs. It seems as if everywhere you go, you do well and there is elevation. I mean, talk us through what has been happening in your coaching career, because so far it seems to be quite a success. Yes, um, I've been pretty blessed, I would say. Uh, I spent probably most of my coaching career at the University of Florida, which is where I swam um, collegiately. Um, and then after that, I was an assistant coach at the University of Florida. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, I was there for 10 seasons. And then I moved to New Orleans and I was the head swimming and diving coach at Tulane University. Um, and then after four seasons there, I moved here to LSU as the associate head coach, um, primarily working with um, the women's team, but I also work with both genders um, here at LSU. So I've been very fortunate. Um, I've had a really great experience coaching a number of different athletes from a variety of backgrounds. And um, it's been fun. It's been challenging and it's been fun. I want you to compare for us as much as you can um, being an elite swimmer versus now being a coach. Oh, that's a great question. I would say that a big, um, uh, what is helpful is that I have competed at that level and I know how challenging, challenging it can be both physically and mentally to perform at that level. Um, and so having that background is 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 beneficial, I, th I would say. Um, but I've learned a lot also as as a coach, as trying to to motivate athletes because everyone is not an athlete. The way I was an athlete, everyone's not gonna be an athlete like that also. Um, so it's definitely kept it interesting um with being able to kind of express and explain you know it's not easy and you're going to have your good days you're going to have your bad days and you know it's just a matter of of navigating and figuring out how can we motivate um our athletes to perform at the level that they're trying to perform at yeah Let's go back to 1996, the Atlanta Olympic Games, your first of two appearances at the Olympics. You became the first black woman to reach the 50-meter freestyle final, the second black woman in the history of the Olympic Games to get to a swimming final. I want to start by asking you if in 1996 you understood the significance of your performances and achievements at the Olympic Games in Atlanta. Um, short answer, no. <laughs> I don't think I understood it at all. I think now that um, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? And I'm a mother of three children. Um, and I think of myself, if one of my children did that, I would be over the moon. I would be completely amazed. But I truly don't think myself at 18 years old in 1996 really grasped the significance of it um, because at that time I was just putting my head down and doing whatever I needed to do um, to try to perform at that level. I think that prior to that I had pretty good preparation in terms of 
Um, I went to a lot of international competitions. I'd competed a lot against the people that I competed against in the finals um, at 96 Olympics. So I don't think that was on the forefront of my mind at all. I, I think my thought was, my goal was to make the finals. I made the finals and everything else was just a cherry on top. Okay, you may have had a sense of what the history that you were creating back in 96 when you were in that final. But what was it like? Take us through the thought process of actually swimming in that final. And what, were your, what was your mindset, given the fact that you were going for history, even from a, from a, just a, from a swing perspective, from the Caribbean, what your mindset was going into that final? And of course, what was it like swimming in the final itself? Yeah, I think that, um... I think for me, if I'm thinking back as to where I was then and just my personality at the time, I think for me, I once I saw, because I placed seventh. To make the final, I was seventh when I, um, I got into the final. So I was just super proud of myself that I made seventh place and I accomplished my goal of making finals. Um, in my mind, it wasn't, I didn't even know, to be honest, that I was the first, I knew I was the first Barbadian to um, make the final, um, but all the other historical things, I was not aware of. I, I, I it, it was not on my radar at all. Um, and so by the mere, pa mere fact that I ended up placing fifth in the final, I was proud of myself because I moved up. I moved up two spots. Now. Coach Leah, the, the Leah coach, watching the video and and seeing that I was like right there and I could have placed third, to me that was just a lack of that extra belief in myself that I could actually um, that I could actually medal. Like in my mind, I final that was my goal, that was great. But I think as a coach, that the coach I am now, if I were to tell the athlete then of you need to believe in yourself more because you can actually final in this. Um, that's probably a little bit more frustrating, but that's just <laughs> me being overachieving more than anything else. <laughs> um, but I, I was very proud of myself. Um, not that I necessarily placed fifth, but because I moved up, I went from seventh to fifth. Yeah. Um, and so that in itself was, was a great accomplishment for me. I think nothing really struck me and it, the, the significance of it didn't really hit me until I went back to Barbados and how excited the country was and how proud everyone said that they were of me for accomplishing what I accomplished. Uh, that didn't hit me until I got back home and there was a, a huge fanfare of um, people at the airport when we returned, um, myself and the other Olympians, when we returned, and then there were just a number of interviews, a number of, everyone wanted me to go different places. And so I was not ready for that <laughs> at all. As an 18 year old, I was not ready for that. I was not ready for people recognizing me on the street. I was not ready for, um, like I would walk down the street and a random person would just call my name. Well, I would turn around because they were calling my name, but it was somebody that I, I didn't know. And so that was something that I was not expecting at all. And when you're at the Olympics, everyone is an Olympian. So you don't really feel that special because <laughs> everyone is an Olympian. And um, but getting out of that environment, that kind of opened up my eyes a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting um, because 28 years on, Leah, do you appreciate more the history that you created in 1996? Um, and how much more do you appreciate it? And how significant, 28 years later, do you see your achievement of 1996? Um, I definitely appreciate it more. But to be honest, the reason I don't, it's not something that I bring up. If, like, I, obviously now I live in the US, so a lot a lot of people don't necessarily know my history unless I bring it up. Um, so, and I don't bring it up that often <laughs> at all. Um, some of my athletes, I'd be surprised if they even know that I 
final in the Olympics because I, I I may say that I I went to two Olympics, but even me saying I went to two Olympics, I don't bring it up all that much, much to the dismay of my boss who's like, you're recruiting people. So you need to tell people that not only did you go to two Olympics, but you finaled in one of them. So I'm working on that. Um, but now that I'm older, I would definitely say I look back at it and I think, well, that was a really good accomplishment. And to be honest, my children don't let me forget it. My son is constantly Googling me and constantly <laughs> like, he will tell people that I did it, but I, 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 I'm I, still very hesitant um, as to whether or not I bring it up, but I'm working on it because it helps with recruiting, obviously, Yeah. Um, for, for, for swimming. But I do look back at it and I, I, I see the significance of it way more than I did when I was going through it. Yeah, a friend of mine, um, by the way, told me that you are that type of personality, um, a little shy, sometimes a little reserved. Um, Correct. <laughs> I think you might actually know him. Is it Janelle? No, his name is Anil Roberts. <laughs> um, I think he might have coached you somewhere along the line or something yes, of that he sort. Did. He did, he did. I, I, I want to know what type of coach he was because, you know, Anil is... Insane. <laughs> the viewers... <laughs> yes, Anil is insane. But outside of that, the viewers love him and i can tell you especially um our sportsman's viewers in jamaica when he did the olympics with us whenever you went on the road all they would be talking about is anil roberts and i wonder okay he's that personality on tv but he's what like is that. this man he like, is like as that. a coach he's, he's like that like there's whatever you see is what he had <laughs> what was it like working with him because first of all he always seems to be on a high <laughs> uh Whoever's laughing is probably <laughs> laughing at a pretty good reason. Um, pretty intense. Um, let me put it this way. I was, I was very appreciative of the experience that I had because essentially once I moved on and I went to college and even with employers that I work now, like to some people, the employers or the other coaches that I've coached for or coached me, may think those coaches are intense, but they're nothing compared to what I experienced before. <laughs> that, that, that is quite interesting. Um, and just <laughs> one, one um, quick one. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit bold by that Anil being intense because I think everybody <laughs> knows that Anil can no, get to No, you're pretty correct. You're on point with that one. A, a different level of of being intense but I want to to get your understanding or I want to get from you um, because at the time you were trained and I understand that that was part of the significance of everything you achieved as well that you were an athlete um, who was trained in the Caribbean and that in itself was something significant that at the time you weren't in the United States you were in the Caribbean and the Caribbean had not seen anything like that before at the time um, yeah, I think from my perspective, I, from my, from my perspective, I moved away from home. So whether I moved away from home to go to the U.S., I moved away from home to go to Trinidad, I moved away from home to go to Australia, wherever it was, for me, I moved away from home. And so that in itself um, is a sacrifice. At the time, I probably um, didn't understand the level of sacrifice, but now that I'm older and I have my own kids, like that was a huge sacrifice for myself and for my parents to have me move away from home to train for the hardest thing that I've ever had I had ever had to do. I moved away from my family, moved away from my friends. I moved away to another country. Yes, it's the Caribbean, but at the end of the day, it's still another country with another, um, with another different culture, um, a different, you know, my parents aren't there with me. I'm living with a family that I didn't know before. Like that in itself was very challenging. And if anything, I would say that is something that I'm also very proud of myself for. 
um, to show that my, to show the strength that I had to endure, you know, the different difficulties that I had to do. But to be honest, even that, as difficult as it was, and it was very, very difficult, it was difficult physically, it was difficult mentally, um, it was difficult emotionally, because as we said, Anna was not an easy coach to swim under, but moving forward the 20 years later, I'm a breast cancer survivor, and going through breast cancer treatment was by far the most difficult thing that I have ever experienced. And so, you know, it's, it, yes, it was a very um, unique situation where I was a Caribbean swimmer training in, at a Caribbean um, country and had a lot of success with that. Um, at the end of the day, it's how, it's how you utilize the resources that you have. And, and, and I think I did a good job of doing that. Yeah, I think you did a great job of doing that. Leah Stansel trailblazer, pioneer, overcomer, an amazing woman, an amazing athlete of the Caribbean. And yeah, we really appreciate you and we appreciate everything that you did on your Olympic journey and everything that you are still doing. Of course, you were um, with the Barbados team at the Tokyo Olympic Games. I, I don't know if you're going to be in Paris, are you? No, I'm not. I'm going to be watching from home this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's fun as well. Just get the Sportsmax app and you can watch um, great Caribbean coverage of the Olympic Games. Leah Stansel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on today's show. Um, and I'm sure we'll be Thank talking you. again sometime. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, Leighton Levy, what a great story. Absolutely amazing. I and mean, it's always nice to speak to the trailblazers because, you know, when somebody breaks that, you know, breaks around, charts that path, it leaves the door open for so many others to follow through. Yes. Unfortunately, in the Caribbean, I don't think we've done enough, and I said we, I mean, across the board, to get more athletes into the Olympics and have them swimming at the level that she swam so many years ago. Yeah. You know, it's not very often that the Caribbean gets athletes in the finals across the world, in the Olympic Games, and something has to be done, I believe, to, to raise the bar a little bit more, a little higher, because I'm expecting medals right away, but certainly there has to be steps, but I don't think we've done enough in the region to get our swimmers. Because we're, we're surrounded by water. We yeah. should be the best swimmers in the world. But unfortunately, that's not been the case. Yeah, a lot of talent in the Caribbean though, and a number of Caribbean athletes will be looking to do something special at Paris 2024. Let's go to another break. More to come in the baton after this. <laughs> It's an Olympic year and with that comes a great deal of mental pressure for athletes. Whether it's the anxiety to qualify for, for the Games, staying focused, not achieving the desired results or suffering an injury that prevents them from participating in training and of course getting to Paris. Now, training hard is one aspect of being an athlete but being mentally well is equally important. Kara McMaster of the British Virgin Islands, the, wor the record holder, sorry, national record holder there for the 400 metre hurdles puts it best. with one of my teammates over here nothing to do with me or how I feel you know whatever the case is and he was saying in Olympic year a lot of athletes become a lot very emotional because they really really want to be there they really want to compete they really want to make the podium so sometimes we are actually make irrational decisions to get there it's Mental Awareness Month, and we found it fitting to get the thoughts of an expert. Alex Olton, she's a sports psychologist from Trinidad and Tobago, currently based in Singapore, and she joins us as we seek some tips to help athletes to trying to qualify for the Olympics to deal with the pressures of an Olympic year. Hello, Alex. Hello there, how are you? I am good, I am good. How are you? A little bit sleepy on this side of the world, but doing well, thanks. <laughs> we understand. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Tell me, you know, how different is it 
for an athlete preparing for the Olympics rather than a regular year of competition? How much more is the pressure? I mean, of course, the Olympics is a pivotal competition for most uh, athletes within Olympic sports. That is the sort of uh, peak uh, competition that you want to aspire to and to uh, achieve uh, something in. Um, I always tell athletes though that it is just a privilege to have the letters OLY behind your name because not everyone can make it to the Olympics and qualify to be in the competition. Um, but certainly uh, as athletes build into the Olympic cycle and the, the end of that cycle draws closer, um, the pressure starts to amount a bit more. Um, and of course, athletes uh, trying to make their qualification marks, some still on that qualification process, some have secured that qualification uh, months ago. And as the, the weeks and months draw closer in to Paris, uh, of course, the emotionality that accompanies such a pivotal moment in an athlete's life will begin to amount. So it's a great deal. How does it manifest? And in, in after that, the second part of the question is, how do they deal with it? Yeah, I mean, Ideally, uh, in, a, in a wonderful ideal world, uh, an athlete would be preparing both, both physically and mentally for this process from the end of the last cycle till now. So ultimately, I would hope um, that athletes aren't preparing mentally for the Olympics now. Uh, you know, it's not a conversation that they're starting to have now, but ultimately maybe they had it some months ago, a year ago, two years ago. Um, I've certainly worked with some athletes who have been preparing since the end of the last cycle. Um, it manifests in a multitude of ways, depending on the athlete, on the sport, um, individual versus team, um, groups of athletes and so on. But it can look anything like uh, you know, a day-to-day -day process for an athlete uh, that they're able to manage and, and just go through the process and continue on the journey uh, to get to where they want to be. And it can look like uh, what we would classify as, I suppose, uh, typical functioning. Um, and then it can it can take the extremes of, of anxiety, breakdowns, uh, mental uh, stress and strain. Um, it can amount to mental illness or mental unwellness in athletes as well. Um, it, it's very, very dependent on, you know, the, the ability of the athlete to, to manage and that support network that they have around them that, that uh, really lends to their preparation for this. And, and how, what does that support look like? Um, of course, everybody says now it should be a sports psychologist as part of that team, uh, that preparatory team for the athletes. Um, but as a sports psychologist who isn't able to be everywhere all the time, we also empower the coaches, um, empower the athletes to develop their support network with their family, their friends, uh, those who will be with them on this journey from start to end. Um, it looks like creating routines, uh, having uh, regular uh, sort of structure within their preparation as well, um, building into their, their confidence and their, their belief uh, towards their preparation for such a big uh, competition. And, um, you know, it, ultimately it, it's just creating that village of support that they will need, uh, not just from the sports psychologists, from their coaches, from their physios, uh, making sure that they are regularly looked after. Um, if you're performing at the elite level, you're going to need the quality support uh, to continue to sustain you at that level. There are people, especially in the Caribbean region, as you may be aware, who believe that the minute you say you need help mentally, then something is wrong with you. So there's a stigma surrounding sports psychology, or psychology for that matter. Um, how do you get around that and can you actually help an athlete who has those barriers, those mental barriers about accepting the help and appreciating the help? Yeah, you're absolutely right to call it a stigma and a barrier. It's very much uh, what it is. Um, and it does create a challenge for us as practitioners in the field, um, particularly working with athletes where there is this element of um, I must be uh, unwavering in my strength and uh, in showing that I need support is a, a sign of weakness. Hopefully uh, that now the more athletes are starting to talk about the importance of, of mental well-being um, and, and that holistic approach 
to their preparation and work and recovering from poor performances and so on. It's becoming a little more normalized, but the way that we get around it is ultimately education um, and, and that psychoeducational piece that we have to drive as practitioners. So as much as we want to just be able to do our work, we also have to advocate for why it's important um, and sharing that knowledge with the people who are uh, the decision makers in an athlete's life as well as the athlete themselves. Um, and I think uh, a really important point to note is that an athlete doesn't necessarily have to have something wrong to speak with a sports psychologist. Actually, sports psychologists can also make uh, athletes who are already performing at a, at a good level or a great level uh, sustain that or, or push them to, to that further point. Uh, now you're hearing athletes talk more and more about the mental piece as it relates to performance because now the marginal gains, particularly in sports like track and field, as you were just discussing, um, it, it creates that that difference uh, for athletes who are able to tap into that mental performance and really have that consistency uh, within any one uh, sort of competition or performance. Let's jump into the field of play now. You're standing up at the 100 meter line. You're in a final with the fastest men ever in the world. How what kind of self-affirmation can you give yourself? And it's not just for the 100. I use 100 because I know the Caribbean people are crazy about the 100 meters. But That's in true. any event, you're, you're lining up in a final or even just a qualifying round. What kind of affirmations can they give themselves to enable them to perform at their best? You know, it varies from athlete to athlete. Um, you know, there's not one magic word or phrase. I wish I had it because then I could <laughs> tell every athlete it and then we'll have some real interesting uh, Olympics. But um, it, it comes even before you get to the blocks, that mental preparation, the the routine that you engage in, what we call your, your pre-performance and your pre-competition routines uh, that athletes have. Uh, you will see the, the top of the top uh, at every sport. They will have certain things that they do within a particular order. They have uh, different superstitions that they rely on or they have different um, patterns in which they engage in before they, they do their performance or before they, they go out to race. Those things are the, the mental side of, of their performance that they're tapping into. Um, you look at any sort of elite athlete at any sport uh, and you'll see them engage in some sort of, uh, for want of a better word, I suppose, a ritual um, that will prepare them mentally. You have certain uh, movements or things that they might say to themselves. Uh, it's what we call cues. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, they basically uh, trigger the thought process that you need to ultimately perform or, or go about doing whatever it is you're, you're hoping to, to, to perform. And you have to consistently do that within your training first uh, before it begins to work in competition because uh, mental skills and the psychology of performance comes with practice. It uh, It's definitely not just something that becomes automatic immediately. Mm. I used to listen to music before I raced. Had a, you know, my Walkman in because you know, I'm dating myself here. But certainly, <laughs> you'd you'd hear I'd play songs that really got my juices going. Is that something that athletes can use to their benefit? Absolutely, um, and it's something that we actively encourage. But we also discuss uh, energy management. So it's knowing when to put that music in, when to get your your as you say your juices going or your your energy levels up. Uh, we incorporate things like breath work into uh, you know relaxation techniques or uh, you know getting athletes ready to do um, and that sort of state of arousal uh, where they can have uh, short, f fast sort of breaths uh, that get them amped up and that heart rate going and so on uh, and it's all just about timing so this is this is where the the real nitty-gritty that we will often overlook at a more amateur level or um sort of you know if we're competing at a, a club um or even just sort of a, a regional level sometimes uh, these little things can be overlooked but when you're talking about olympics these things are the the make or break between um great performances and good performances. My co-host Ricardo plays tennis, huh? and I'm told that tennis players are among the best in the world when it comes to mental management because they have to have very short memories. A bad point doesn't necessarily mean a bad match. How different is it for tennis players as opposed to other sports? Is it something that is a myth or is it the reality for that tennis players are able to do this better than most? Um, I think it, it, it is very sport dependent. Um, I think that the quality you're sort of tapping into is is what we would call resilience, your ability to sort of, uh, as it were, bounce back. Um, but resilience is very trainable. Um, and if you look at 
uh, cricket is uh, it's an extremely uh, mental sport uh, at the the test level um, of cricket or even at the the 50 you know 50 overs uh, games that you're looking at one day internationals the t20s are a little bit faster um, and require a different kind of resilience um, you know golfers all the same you have one bad shot uh, you know you, you don't make par or you're just under par or whatever it is and then you're trying to to be better at the next hole you, you any sport that requires as you to kind of carry on in the face of challenge um will certainly tap into that resilience and resilience is something that that is very much trainable and and should be trained rather than expected to just happen when the challenge arises All right so just to wrap up now give us some of your 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 go to quick your tips for managing your mental phases while you're getting into preparation for competition and to get the best out of yourself while you're competing oh um <laughs> i would say probably have have a have a routine that works for you um manage your energy well uh plan and time when you're going to eat when you're going to drink uh you know what music are you going to listen to at what point um get that great night's sleep the night before that has a massive impact on on the energy that we start the day with um creating your performance rituals are really really important and just understanding it's it's that cultivating that element of self awareness within athletes knowing what you need when you need it and what is happening uh, and and what emotions uh, are you experiencing at a certain point in time and what is going to help you uh, manage those emotions yeah you know alex depending on where an athlete is in their career what stage of their careers they're at the pressure can be different. So it might be different for an athlete who is going to the Olympic Games for the first time, and it might be completely different for an athlete who feels that this is going to be the last opportunity. Is there a different way you approach um, sessions with these athletes, just dependent on the stage of their career that they find themselves? Absolutely. Um, you know, transition for an athlete from their elite career into what we would call athlete retirement or, you know, post sporting career is very, very um, profound and can be an extremely uh, sort of grief filled area of an athlete's life, um, learning to, to, to let go of what once was and move into a new space and something completely different. Um, every athlete, every sport, every competition will require different um, combinations of mental skills, as it were. Um, the mental skills remain the same across sports and across athletes. It's just how we package them uh, for athletes within different stages of their career. Similarly, an athlete transitioning out of, uh, let's say, injury and back into competition and, and expecting to perform uh, will also be in a, a very different uh, mental headspace to say an athlete who had started their season and is is you know in complete flow and going through uh, everything and is completely healthy uh, so it's it's definitely very dependent on where the athlete is uh, in and what stage of life uh, they're going through at that point in time yeah and i guess part of the pressure as well especially for an athlete who is on their way out is I want to finish with a bang. I want to finish strong. And that comes with additional pressure and additional stress. How do you train and coach them through um, that period? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, you know, an athlete is always going to want to um, end their career with the fireworks and guns blazing and whatnot. But um, it's also about uh, focusing on the process rather than the outcome that we're looking for um, and talking to athletes about the things that are within their control versus the things that are out of their control. Uh, while it might seem or people might argue that, well, finishing, you know, on a high note and, and uh, on a gold medal is within their control, but actually that's just an outcome of the things that are within their control. So it's it's about getting the athlete to focus in on the, the things that they have the ability to, uh, you know, perfect or, or not necessarily perfect but refine and fine tune uh, to the point where they're in a, a place of preparation and readiness to attempt the performance that will then lend to the outcome so it's a, it's about focusing on the process rather than than the outcome with the athlete yeah perfectly said alex alton such a pleasure having you on le baton and uh, will you be in paris by the way 
I will not, unfortunately. But I will be awake and cheering on my athletes and so on. So uh, you will find me awake again. <laughs> All right, Alex, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. For Thank you, same here. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. Um, you know, Leighton, that's my favorite line, you know. Focus on the process the result will take care of itself. That and that's what I tell athletes all, all the, the time. time because you cannot control the type of shape that your competitors will turn up in, whether it be track and field, swimming, um, football, tennis. What you can control is how you prepare. Yep. You might not even be able to control how fast you run or how well you perform, but it's just about focusing on that process and then allowing everything else to take yeah, care of itself. Yeah, the outcome is always going to be beyond you. I mean, the outcome, you have no control over the outcome whatsoever. What you can control is how you prepare. Yeah. Because when you look, for example, at what happened in 2008 with Usain Bolt, yeah. anybody that's in that race would have figured that they, at being at their best, yeah. would not expect somebody to be beating them chest 15 meters out and still breaking a world record. Yeah. You have no control over that. Yeah. You know, so it is, the, the outcome is always dependent on anything but yeah, that you cannot control. Yeah. And so you can only prepare. Control what you can, which is your preparation. Yeah. Focus on the process. The result will take care of itself. Message to all our athletes across the Caribbean. Let's go to another break. So much more to come on Le Baton. Yeah, the games of the 33rd Olympiad, Paris, France. And as you know, French is the official language of the host country. We want to ensure that your French is up to speed for the games. We have on set with us both a French teacher and a teacher of French, Melina Helias. And she'll be taking us through some of the basics so we can improve our speaking as we get ready. So, my producers have put some French <laughs> on the prompter. Bonjour et bienvenue, chef. Did, did I get that right? Did Almost. I get that right? Pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> close enough. Yes. I'll take pretty close. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I am good. First of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I come from Brittany, which is a region of France. Mm -hmm. And I've been living in Jamaica for a few years. Mm. You, you sound like you, there's a mixture of Jamaican, Jamaican. and French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and when you say a few years, and what brought you to Jamaica? Sports journalism. So I write about Jamaican track and field in the French newspaper. Mm. Oh, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and what's that been like? It's been amazing yeah. and very exciting going to boys and girls chums and all of that. Yeah, all right. Mm. Okay, so here we go then. We want to learn French. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with the name of our show, shall we? Sure. Um, Leighton, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> well, better, never, better late than never, let's go. <laughs> right, let's go. Okay. See our class. Le bâton. Le bâton. Awesome, Ricardo. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Le bâton. Very good. Oh, wow, I'm such a bright spark. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> All right, what else are we learning? We've mastered that. So have you actually learned uh, some French in high school? Me? No, but I did Spanish oh, and I wasn't Spanish. very good at it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a little. A little bit? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The only thing I learned in Spanish was Chico no sé. <laughs> so the, the main difference is Fran French have a lot of silent letters. Mm -hmm. So if you do like Spanish and you tend to try and, and pronounce everything, you're going to uh, pronounce a lot of words that you're supposed to ignore. Mm -hmm. So that's the hard part about the spelling. Um, but what I can teach you would be, how, how would you say hello and my name is? Yes, I would love to learn okay. that. Okay, I'm sure you already know it. Do I? Yes. How do you say hello in French, Leighton? I have no idea. Oh, come on, Leighton. No. You, you do your <laughs> You're the guys going to France, you know? <laughs> Bonjour. Bonjour, excellent. Bonjour. Okay, go, go. Mm -hmm. good. And if it's night or good evening, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, yes. Okay. Mm. 
bonjour, that's if it's morning. Mm -hmm. Or afternoon. Or and afternoon. Then after the sun set, you can start to say bonsoir. Bonsoir. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. Beautiful. You need All to right. get me on the plane. <laughs> if you do better. <laughs> <laughs> So right. if you want to introduce yourself, you can say, Je m'appelle Melena. Je m'appelle. <laughs> Je m'appelle. Je <laughs> m'appelle. Sorry. See, I told you I wasn't going to Start again. Say it again. Je m'appelle. Je m'appelle. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And someone could ask you, mm -hmm. ask you, comment tu t'appelles? And you and would say, you say, je, je m'appelle. Je m'appelle Layton. Okay. All right. Wow. You know, I, I was hoping you, you weren't going to say Helena. <laughs> <laughs> Je m'appelle Ricardo. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, all right. Okay. What else are we learning? Comment ça va? How are you? Uh huh. Comment ça va, Leighton? I am good. <laughs> <laughs> en français. En français. Ça va très bien. Or comme si, comme ça. Uh, slow that down for me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to say? I am, You're doing I am, well? Yeah, I'm doing okay. well. Ça va bien. Ça va. Ça va bien. Ça va bien. Ça va bien. 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 Okay. Excellent. Okay. Ça, ça va bien. bien. Uh -huh. Okay. Ah. Mm, I am well. Ça yeah. va bien. What do you say? I am hungry. Because that, you know, because it's <laughs> J'ai faim. J'ai faim. Uh huh. Yeah. J'ai faim. J'ai faim. That's it. J'ai mm -hmm. faim. How do you spell that? Is that J A? Yeah. J A I. I S. No S. No S. And then F A I M. Ah, J'ai faim. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Um, if you're tired, you can say, Je suis fatigué. Je suis fatigué. Je suis fatigué. <laughs> fatigué. Fatigué. Yeah. Yes. It's like fatigue mm -hmm. in English. Yes. Okay, cool. Je suis fatigué. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am tired. Yes. So let us say no because we get to France, we're a little bit lost, and we want to get to the stadium. Mm -hmm. And I need to say, I want to go to the stadium. Okay, let me teach you where is the stadium. That would be a little bit easier. Yeah. Ah, so you can stop easy. somebody in the street. Yes. People from Paris are not necessarily known for being the nicest people, no, but not. maybe you could <laughs> meet someone from country, who knows, that would be um, ready to assist you. So you can say, excusez-moi, excuse me, excusez-moi, où est le stade? Où est le stade? Where is où the stadium? Où est le stade? Okay. Mm -hmm. Où est, est le, stade? le stade? Wow, excellent. Where is the stadium? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Où est le stade? Right. This thing is not so difficult, so why do people pretend like <laughs> this is difficult? <laughs> All right, let's get to some harder things. Mm -hmm. mm. More complicated. Okay, if you're going to a shop, let's say to a boulangerie, and you want to buy some bread, you, you have two different ways to say please depending on who you're talking to. So if you're talking to a friend, you're going to say, s'il te plaît, but to say please, but careful. If you're going to a shop, you can't say s'il te plaît because it's not somebody you know personally. So you're going to tell them s'il vous plaît. So s'il te plaît for someone you know, and more formal, s'il vous plaît. S'il vous plaît. Uh -huh. S'il vous, vous plaît. plaît. I don't right. think I'll have friends in <laughs> Paris, so no. I'll just practice. Yes. Sylvain. Vous... Sylvain. <laughs> okay. Right. And if I want to say, I want to go to the supermarket, or where is the supermarket? Okay, let's keep it to where is. Mm, so, yes. où est le supermarché? Le... Hmm? Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm processing. Où, où est, est le supermarché? Où est le supermarché? Le Supermarché. Le supermarché. Okay, like it's like, like, like when I was in Saint Martin, the Grand Marché supermarket. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I used to live on the Dutch okay. side of Saint Martin, nice. not the French side. Um, it was too expensive. <laughs> Où est <laughs> supermarché? Le supermarché. Yeah. yeah, very okay. good. That's not. This is not so hard at all. No. I know. This my brain is still spinning right now. Où est le supermarché? Yeah. Right. Ah, okay. Beautiful. Where is the tennis courts? <laughs> <laughs> Où est le cours de tennis? Say what? <laughs> le cours de tennis. Où est le cours de tennis? Mm -hmm. Ah. Is the tennis? Uh-huh. Okay, as in B-E... Tennis, same thing. Okay. Same spelling. Okay, cool. Yes. Ah. Où est le tennis? Le... No, I think there's a word missing. Le cours. Le cours. Yes. So instead of saying tennis court, you switch it. Okay. Le cours de tennis. Le cours de tennis. 
Uh -huh. Ou et le coup de tennis. Amazing. Okay, how do you hail like, like a taxi in, in Paris? How do you take a taxi? Um, okay, like pretending if you're on the phone? Or no, yeah, well, either way. I mean, if I'm hailing a cab, for example, other than the signal, what, you know. Or how do you ask how you can get a taxi? taxi. Mm, comment? Comment? Puis-je avoir un taxi? That's so a bit hard. Yeah, yeah th this now is getting hard. Yeah, <laughs> comment? Mm -hmm. Puis-je puis avoir, avoir or trouver, okay, let's say trouver to find, yeah. un taxi? Okay. I <laughs> didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let, let's, do, let, let's go with that one again. Yeah, slowly, yeah. Okay. Comment, comment, comment puis-je puis trouver, trouver un taxi? A taxi. I can't remember all of it. There's a reason <laughs> I'm too old for this. <laughs> so it's comment, mm -hmm. trouver. It's trouver. 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 Yeah. Comment, trouver. trouver. Un, un taxi. Taxi. Oh, taxi. Okay. Oh. Comment trouver un taxi? taxi? Right, excellent. There you go. Wow. Oh. <laughs> how, how are we doing? We're not doing too badly. Excellent are we? pronunciation. Yeah. I want to go to the airport. Je veux aller à l'aéroport. Je veux aller. I don't remember the rest. À l'aéroport. À. What's airport? Aéroport. Aéroport? Excellent. Oh, wow. Yeah. You, you can tell me about the airport. <laughs> I'll just stand up there and I'll be <laughs> uh, So, where are you from? Because I figure that is going to be a popular question we ask when we get to Paris. So many nationalities mm -hmm. there. D'où venez-vous? D'où venez-vous? Mm -hmm. D'où venez-vous? D'où venez-vous? Very good. Okay. D'où venez-vous? Mm -hmm. Where are you from? How do I say I am from Jamaica or I am Jamaica? Okay. Um, je suis. Je suis en Jamaïque. Yes, you are in Jamaica right now, but you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say you're Jamaican. So, yes. Je suis Jamaica. <laughs> je suis Jamaica. Oui. Okay, good. Oh, perfect. Je suis Jamaica. Yeah. Jamaica. Jamaica. Um, but English does not have that sound. So my students usually struggle with that one. Uh, and if it's, if it's a female talking, she has to say, je suis Jamaïcaine. Oh, yeah. OK. Jamaïcain, Jamaïcaine. So there are a lot of things that are gender specific. Yes. OK. Yes. Don't get it wrong, Leighton. Don't no. get it wrong. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Malena, it's been a pleasure. How do I say thank you? Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. You're ah, welcome. Merci beaucoup. De rien. How do you say you're welcome? Um, je vous en prie. Yes. <laughs> we are completely out of time. Lytton is having way too much fun. Melina, it was a really a pleasure having you. By the way, are you going to be in Paris for the Olympics? That's the goal. That, it's not confirmed as yet, but hopefully. That's the goal. Well, yes. can't have the Olympic Games in Paris and the Jamaican French woman isn't there. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully that you'll be in Paris for the Olympic Games. Thank you very much for joining us again for another episode of Le Baton. Yes, teacher yeah. says I got it correct. Perfect. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll be back next week. And when Donald returns next week, I will have to teach him all the French I've learned today, which means I have to go home and practice. Take care. Bye-bye.